Again, sorry about all that. It's just a learning curve trying to get this done. Kylan's been doing pretty good on Sunday evenings and Wednesday nights doing it for me. So, um, so Romans 8, uh, again, starting in, in verse 1. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also live in your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together with him. So Christ died so that you and I could be free. Christ died so you and I could have everlasting life. And if someone is listening to this, that they have never trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that today is the day to do that, to ask Him to forgive you of your sins so you can be on your way to heaven. But for those of us who already have done that, have already trusted in Christ, things have changed. They have changed drastically. We are no longer enemies of God, but we are part of the family of God. And Paul, as he's writing here, he wants us to realize that... that when we get saved, we get saved by Christ and Christ alone. You're not saved because you're in church this morning. Going to church doesn't save you. You're not saved this morning because you put some money in the offering plate. Giving money to the church does not save you. You're not saved this morning if you've just been baptized. Because baptism can't save you. You're not saved this morning if you think just taking communion will save you as we celebrate the Lord's Supper here later. It will not save you. Only knowing Jesus Christ and believing in His death, His burial, His resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins will save you and take you to heaven. There are so many religions out there. Even people who would call themselves Christian teaches something otherwise. The Bible is very clear. The only way to heaven... It's through Jesus. It's not through the church. It's not through doing functions of the church. It's not even being a good neighbor. I hear this many times. Such and such was such a good neighbor or such a good person. If, if anyone made it into heaven, it would be them. That goes against scripture. Being a good person won't get you into heaven. Only Jesus will get you into heaven. I'm glad it's that way because I can never be good enough to get to heaven myself. But knowing Jesus Christ has saved me. Everyone who trusts in Christ, the Bible tells us things have changed because now we are a new creature. We are a new creature. Things have changed. The Bible tells us the moment we trust and believe in Jesus Christ, our old self has changed. We now have the Holy Spirit living in us. We also have Jesus Christ as He's living in our heart when we believe in Him. We are a new being the moment we trust in Jesus to save us. And some people, that change is very dramatic. You can immediately see, especially if it's someone who's older, 
They get saved later in life. Some things change so drastically for them. They get saved sometimes with kids getting saved young. We don't see as much of a change, but there's still a change there. But you're a new creature the moment you trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're listening to this and you have never trusted in Jesus, and you're thinking, well, I don't see myself being a new creature, because you're not until you believe in Jesus Christ, until you believe in His death, burial, resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. And so the Holy Spirit, when it comes into our hearts, the Bible tells us, as Paul's writing here, the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and lives, and the Holy Spirit knocks on our heart in a, like a silent-like way to our soul, our spirit, and tells us when we should or should not be doing something. You don't have that until you get saved. Before you get saved, all you have is conscience. And conscience can change. But the Holy Spirit is a second conscience we have, a more powerful conscience that comes to live in the heart of a believer. And, and the Holy Spirit says, that attitude you had, even though no one else knew, but I, the Holy Spirit saw that, he th knew your thoughts, he says, that wasn't right. As we study in Sunday school, Paul talks about having the mind of Christ. It's a commandment. He says, let this mind of Christ be in you. And again, that let is in the Greek, it's a command. It's one of the strongest commands that the Greek can have. And he says, you must have the mind of Christ. You can either choose to or not to, but Paul says, if you want to be right with God, you need to be focusing on having the mind of Christ. And think about all the problems we faced this past year, the struggles we've gone through. How each of us were honest, there had been a time that we have snapped at somebody we should not have snapped at. Or we've said something we should not have said. Or we behaved in a way we should not have behaved. You know why we've done that? Because we're still dealing with sin that's in our heart. Even though we've been saved, even though the Holy Spirit's there, we still have that sinful nature that Paul talked about back in chapter 7. He said, that which he wished he did not do, that he did. That which he wished he did, he did not do. And even he said, when I do good and I try to do what's right, he says, evil's still present in me. He still struggled with, even when he was doing what he thought he was supposed to be doing right, that he still had evil thoughts from time to time. Just think about all the evil thoughts that we had that we may not even vocally shared this past couple years over someone's behavior or their attitude that we just didn't like. Christ says, have this mind that I have. How did Christ think about us when we were sinners? How did Christ think about us when we were misbehaving and not believing in God at that time? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew our thoughts. He knew our actions. Even things that maybe no one else ever knew. He saw it. And He still loved us that much. As we celebrate communion, that He died for us. He was buried and He rose again. And that all who believe Him will have everlasting life. The Holy Spirit convicts our soul, our spirit, when we're doing something that's wrong. The Holy Spirit tells us we should not go there, we should not say that, we should not think that. So being a good neighbor, again, won't get you to heaven. Being a good neighbor is not wrong. I think the Bible teaches that we should be a good neighbor. But being a good neighbor is not enough. If you kept everything in God's Word, maybe at that point you might be lucky enough it's good enough. But you know what? You can't. That's the whole purpose of the Old Testament law will show that men cannot do everything that God expects of them to be able to get into heaven. It proved to the Jewish people that no matter how good they tried to be, no matter how much they kept every jot and tittle of God's Word, they could not make it in heaven because they couldn't do it all. You fail one time, the Bible says, in one part of the law, you have failed it all. You say, well, I haven't done such and such. Well, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever had an evil thought about somebody else? Have you ever lost your cool and got angry when you shouldn't have got angry? If you have, you've broken the law. If you've broken one part of it, you're guilty of it all. So you can't get to heaven yourself. That is why Jesus had to die. Jesus had to die because we could not be good enough to get to heaven. If anyone was ever able to be good enough, then Jesus would never have had to die. But 
because none of us are good. None of us can make it to heaven on our own. Jesus came and did what we could not do. He kept the law and he died in our place for our sins. And if we believe in him, he'll take us to heaven. And so Paul, as he's writing here, he's trying to get the people at the church at Rome and us today to realize that these things that we hold on to that are important, that we think are good, there's nothing wrong with them, but they cannot take the place of what true salvation is. It has to come through Jesus and Jesus alone. So what do we do with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection will depend on where we spend for eternity. Where that family member will spend for eternity. Where that friend or that neighbor will spend eternity. It's what they do with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's what it's all about. You know, it's hard sometimes if you have to talk to a family member about getting saved. It's difficult. But you know, if you don't tell them and they don't hear from someone else, if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, what happens to them when they die? They don't go to heaven. Because <laughs> the only way to get there is how? Through Jesus Christ. That is the only way. If we truly believe that, and we believe it deep in our hearts and our souls, that the only way anyone gets into heaven is through Jesus Christ, then we need to make sure we're telling people about Jesus Christ. Our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. Because that's the only way they can get to heaven. And the Bible says, how are they going to hear if someone doesn't go and tell them? You might be the only person that has a chance to share the gospel with that person who needs to get saved. And you have a responsibility to do that. Paul also says, until we trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to forgive us of our sins, we are considered enemies of God. Some people say, no, oh, I'm not an enemy against God. I don't believe in Jesus Christ, but I'm not an enemy against God. Well, the Bible says you are. The Bible says that you are an enemy against God. And what, was, what does one enemy in war do against another enemy in war? They try to kill them, to annihilate them, to get rid of them. But we have this situation where Jesus steps into the picture. As I, I, my wife told me, there's Christmas stuff out already. And to remind us what Jesus did as he came to be born of a baby, became part of his creation to grow up just so he could die for you and I who were his enemies. He steps into the picture and he makes a way for us no longer to be enemies against God. That's just nice as in itself, right? That you're not God's enemy anymore. But he takes it even further than that. Not only are we no longer his enemies, but now we are God's friend. And more so than that, we're not only God's friend, we are part of God's family. Wow, what a change that takes place. Again, Paul says there's this major change takes place the moment we trust in Jesus Christ. We move from being enemies against God, not just to become friends of God, but now we are considered intimate, close family of God. To the point that we are given the same rights of any child who's adopted. We get to become heirs and join heirs with Jesus Christ. And so all the children of God have this Holy Spirit living in their hearts. And this Holy Spirit that's in our hearts is a promise to us. It's a promise to us that we are God's child. Sometimes people come to me and say, I just wonder if I'm truly saved or not. And I say, well, I can't tell you that for sure. I can tell you what Scripture says, and I can show you from Scripture. But the Bible tells us that God gives us His Holy Spirit to help us to see if we're saved or not. The Holy Spirit convicts us of things that the, that the world says is okay, but we know is wrong because what tells us is wrong? God's Word. How do we know God's Word is wrong? Because the Holy Spirit reminds us that it's wrong. The Holy Spirit is that payment that we have not only of a promise of eternal life, but it is also that payment to help us to see that we are saved, that we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. And the Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we are a child of God. That we are truly a part of God's family. 
Most of you may have some family members that maybe are kind of considered outcasts or cause problems, but they're still your family. No matter how bad they may be, no matter how much you disagree maybe of their lifestyle or their choices or what they got going on, they are still family. There's a connection there with family that cannot be understood or changed. Even kids sometimes who have been basically left by their parents and they're re-raised and they, later in life as adults they reconnect with their genetic parents. There's something that takes place there. There's this bond that takes place and happens and there's this connection because of family. You have that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have that connection of family, the family of God. That the Holy Spirit allows us to have. The Holy Spirit tells us that we're a part of. The Holy Spirit convicts us in our hearts when we do things that are wrong. Not only do we have the Holy Spirit the moment we trust in Jesus Christ, Paul expounds that Jesus Christ himself lives in our heart. Think about that. You have two parts of the God. I believe all, all three parts are present because I think the Father is also there. But we have two parts that are clearly taught in Scripture. The moment someone trusts in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in their heart and makes a new creature, a new creation out of them and, and changes us. And then also Jesus Christ as He is dwelling in our heart. He's living there with us. He's guiding and directing us. Isn't that nice to know? Because if I was left to my own devices and my own choices and, and doing things my own way and the Holy Spirit wasn't a part of my heart and Jesus Christ wasn't a part of my heart, you know what would happen to me? Same thing that happened to you. I'd make wrong decisions after wrong decisions after wrong decisions. Same thing that happened to you, that we'll be living in sin all the time. But that Holy Spirit comes and knocks on our heart and says, I don't think you should be doing that. I don't think you should think that. You shouldn't behave that way. The Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit that we're a child of God, and then God the Father says you need to make some changes. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, tells us in our heart we need to make some changes and live more like Him. And then we go to the Scripture and we see how Jesus handled the same situations we're handling. How did He behave? How did He think? Many times we're even told the thought of Christ in Scripture. You know why? Because we're commanded to have the mind of Christ. So how are we supposed to know the mind of Christ if we don't know how he thought? Isn't it nice to know that we can know how Jesus thought so we can have that mind we're commanded to have? So God raised Jesus from the dead and by trusting in him, Paul tells us, you have this promise because Jesus came from the dead and he rose again. If you believe in him, you have this promise of the Holy Spirit and of Christ being in your heart that when you die, what will happen to you? One day you'll be raised from the dead. Again, as we represent communion, what it represents. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That he paid a way for our sins, and he has a place for us in eternity, and he promises all who believe in him he will take there. One day our soul will be reunited with our bodies, and we'll have a new body. I long for that new body. Amen. I mean, after having two hip replacements, I, I can understand the pain part of it. I didn't understand it a whole lot. But I long for that body as much as the pain of the body is. I long for that body not to have a desire to sin again. Not to have a thought of sin again. I long for that day. And one day I'll have it. You will too if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. So we have this promise that because Jesus died, was buried, and rose again, all who believe him will also experience the same thing. Isn't that wonderful to know that this is not all there is? It'd be a pretty bad life that this is all, all that we can look forward to. Especially this past couple years, all the problems and the struggles and dealing with trying to even get family together, dealing with COVID. I'm glad this is not all we got to look forward to. I'm looking forward to that day when things will be a whole lot better. And, and Paul expounds a little bit more on this, no enemies of God. And, and he says that we're no enemies of God anymore because we were bought with a price. What was that price that we were bought from? Bought from sin with Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection. Think about that. God loves you so much even in your sinful state, 
before you got saved, Jesus loved you so much, and He loves you right now if you're not saved. I'm going to let you know that. And He's willing to save you if you're willing to come forward and get saved and believe in His Word, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. He loved you so much that He died for you. His death was, if no one else in here, just you alone, just say Pastor Jim. Pastor Jim's sin was so surmountable, so overwhelming. There is no way anything in this world could take care of it. My sin was that deep. But Jesus Christ's blood that came from heaven, that became born as a baby, that lived a human life that never sinned, but also God at the same time, the whole entire time. His blood was able to wash away not all, only all of my sins, as great as they were, but all your sins too. All the sins of every human being throughout human history, if they would trust in Jesus Christ, His blood is sufficient to wash away all the sins of the world for anyone who will believe in Him. That's what the payment was. That's what was required from God the Father because we have sinned. We broke His law. Death had to come. Separation from God had to happen until Jesus made another way. And so we have to believe in Jesus' death, His burial, His resurrection for, for the forgiveness of our sins. And that's all that's required. of You don't have to be a church member this morning to participate when we ha celebrate communion. You don't have to be baptized to celebrate communion with us today. Scripture just clearly teaches you have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's what's required. Because that's what this represents. Otherwise, you're participating in a memorial that doesn't mean anything to you. It, if you do so, that's fine. We're not going to stop you. We don't have that say-so. That's between you and God. But it's just a memorial. It's to remind you what Jesus has done. And guess what? We forget stuff pretty easily, don't we? Think of things that you may have forgot this past year. Some of us may have, since it's been so long, forgot what it's like to hug somebody. Because we haven't done it. We have memorials set up even in our Constitution and in our American holidays and so forth to remind us to remember things that are important. Such as uh, the Declaration of Independence. As bad as some things seem sometimes in our country, and obviously, yes, it's worse than what it was for most of you when you were kids growing up. As bad as it may seem to be in our country today, you know we're still the freest country in the world today? We are the country that has the most freedom of religion anywhere in the world today. Um, you may have read the article about the pastor up in Canada who's trying to hold services. And he was told he only allowed to have so many people in his service, and he refused to do that. He thought he should have as many as it would show up. He got arrested. I don't know if there's any, there's probably some other backstory there. I don't know about it. There is. But just think about it. In countries like that, just gathering together where we have more than 15 or 20 percent of our church get together, the pastor can get arrested. Whether there's other things going on, again, I don't know. Aren't you glad that doesn't happen here in the United States right now? We were close on it, I think, or some places during the COVID when it was at the, the beginning stages that churches were threatened with the, the pastors getting arrested or those churches were going to be at, um, shut down and taken. Luckily, our, our government and our freedom of religion protected that, but we were close there a few times. Luckily, here in Ohio, we, our governor has been pretty uh, consistent about allowing us to do what we think we need to do within religion. But not every state's been that way. But we have great freedoms in Christ. Even if our country takes away all of our freedoms, we still have the greatest freedoms because we know Jesus Christ is our Savior. And that can never be taken away from us. They can take our life from us. They can beat us up. They can throw us in jail for our faith. But they can never take away our freedom we have in Jesus Christ. And that's a lot what America was founded upon, that same freedom principle. As people wanted this freedom to, to be able to worship God as they felt free to do so. And not to be told of what they could or could not do. So before Christ saved you, you were enemies of God. 
But again, once we trust in Jesus Christ, we become friends of God, families of God. And you know what? As great as it is to be an American citizen, I have a citizenship beyond this place, beyond this world, that's even greater. A citizenship in heaven. Isn't it nice to know that no matter what happens, no matter what Satan says, you can say, I am a citizen of heaven and there's nothing you can do to stop me from going because I have believed in Jesus Christ. And he has paid that way for my citizenship that can never be taken away from me. That's wonderful to know. The Holy Spirit also provides other things for us as many have experienced again. I don't think any of us have been untouched from death in one way or another in the last few years. The Holy Spirit comes and gives us a special comfort that we can't get from family. Family's nice to have. We need family around us. But that special comfort can only come through the Holy Spirit. That encouragement that can only come from God. The Holy Spirit helps us to say the right thing at the right time in the right place if we listen to the Holy Spirit. And so as you're sitting there, maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about some things that you know you need to be working on for the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in a moment, we'll have a time of silence. If there's something you know in your heart that you need to make right with God, take that time to make it right with the Lord. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. We can make time for you to come up and I can share you from God's Word how you can be saved this morning. And while I've taken this moment of silence, if you happen to be in that situation, don't delay. Come up and tap me and I'll go with you and I'll show you from God's Word and then we'll come back and have communion after that. Or you can check with me after church if you don't want to do it during the service. But know Jesus Christ is your Savior. That is the most important thing you ever may do in life is to come to know Him. His burial, His resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. And so Jesus has given us a lot, hasn't He? It's very easy for us to think about the things that we don't have. They would forget about all that we do have. And may God help us remember what all God has given to us, each and every one of us, by knowing Christ as our Savior. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, Lord, we thank you for this time. And Lord, here in a second, we're going to take a moment of silence. And, and we pray, Father, as we search our hearts, we pray you show us from your word things that we need to make right with you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You got a hymn you want to sing while we pass out the communion cups? 241. If you can sing and hold your hymnal as you get a cup, feel free to do so. Um, if someone else wants to come up and pass out the other ones while we sing 241, I'd appreciate it. So that John doesn't have to do it by himself? Okay. I'll, I can do it. I'll do it. You guys can sing without me. 241. Okay. So sweet to trust in Jesus Just to trust Him at His word Just to know upon His promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove Him or and or Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to to trust Him more. Verse 4. I'm so glad I've learned to trust Thee, precious Jesus.
is a Savior friend, and I know that thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust him more. Did everybody get a cup who wanted one? If not, raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. Okay, we'll sit down and take a moment of silence. About a minute or so, ask God to search your heart. If you know already you have something you need to turn over to the Lord, please do that at this moment. Did you get one, Kathy? Okay. Let's take a moment of silence, please. Lord, we do thank you for this time as we get ready to remember what Jesus has done for us, as we remember about him shedding his blood and having his body broken for us. And we pray, Lord, if there's one here or one listening who does not know Christ as their Savior, that today they would trust in him. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, even though this is a little different, and if you're at home, if you have your own grape juice and bread, you do it at home. If you want a communion cup and you want to do this later at home, let me know. I'll try to get one to you. But let's peel off the top layer. You may have to bend it. Each one's a little bit different. The newer ones bend a little easier, but uh, I don't know if they'll all do the same or not. Um, just peel the plastic layer off. If yours is uh, one, you may have to push it down and pull it up to get the top layer off. And then it should give you the wafer that's available. You need help, Georgia? I'll come and help you. Hold on. Okay. Yep. Anybody else need help? And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians that, that Jesus, as he was sitting down with his disciples, as it was at the time for him to die for the sins of the world, he, he broke the bread and he passed it out and he said, this bread represents my body. Before we partake, I'd like to ask John to pray for the bread, please. Amen. And Jesus said that same night, this body was broken for you. As often as you take this bread, you remember this, my, my body, until I come. Let us take. So in like manner, it says after he broke the bread and told him that it represents his body broken, he did the cup. If you are able to open up your cup, if you need help before we pray for the cup, I'll come and help you. Keith, would you be able to pray for the cup here in a second? If you're, if you're distracted, let me know. <laughs> I know you got your hands there. <laughs> Everybody get their cup opened up. Okay, Heath, could you pray for the cup, please? And Jesus, in like manner, says, This cup represents my blood that's going to be shed for you. He says, Often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. Let us drink. 
And Paul says that, that uh, as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we show his remembrance, we have this memorial, and we do so until the day he comes. And so I'd like for us to, to go out of here singing a hymn, um, one verse of victory in Jesus, as we celebrate this memorable event in Jesus' life and in our life as we believed in Jesus Christ, as the table represents us as the family of God. Let's sing as the family of God the first verse of a victory in Jesus together.